Hello and welcome to the Salt of the Earth podcast. This is episode 16. I am Thomas and this is my compatriot. Jonathan. Um, and today we're going to be talking about immaturity. But, sure, but this is actually <laughs> episode 17. It is 17? Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. This is episode 17. Apparently the numbers got mixed up somewhere. I was going to mention that to you earlier, but I forgot, so. Okay. <laughs> so this is episode 17, and it's not about being immature. It's about maturing, actually. So Maturing, maturing, as they say. As somebody says somewhere. Maturing in Christ, or in other words, growing, which seems to be the word everyone uses. Always. They're always growing. Everyone's always growing. Um, mm-hmm. But are they always growing? Yeah, once, it's done, once you're done growing upwards, you start growing outwards. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we're not talking about getting wider here or getting taller. We're talking about, um, what would be a way to describe it? Maturing. Oh. Okay, without using the word maturing. Oh. Or uh, growing. Um, well, maybe you can use growing. Becoming more like Christ. Becoming more like Christ. Okay, there, there's a there's a defin, decent definition, or uh, maybe becoming mm, becoming what Christ would want us to be like, or eh, all in the same bucket. Um, mm-hmm. So, first point that should be made, and that should be pretty fa- fairly obvious, I think, to everyone, is that um, we should all be maturing all the time. Like all the time, there's no break time for maturing. Um, mm-hmm. y- you should naturally be able to. You should con- be able to confidently say, "Yes, I am growing. Here is how I have grown in the past. Here is how I'm currently." You know, you should. Every Christian should be able to say these things. They should not. You know, if they were asked, they should be. They shouldn't just like draw a blank and be like, "Well, I don't know." I guess I'm not plateauing or something that that shouldn't be the case that we should always be growing um, because we've never reached the goal of becoming more like Christ right yeah because our ultimate goal is perfection and perfection is unattainable so it's it's a it's like a never-ending task the only place you want to plateau is when you are Jesus (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when you're per- when you're perfect, when you're Jesus, we, yeah, we don't get there, so we we don't get to plateau. Yeah, um, yeah. There's no because in in Christianity, there's no um, there's no. It's not like we talked about before. It's not a, not a set of rules or a checked box. It's a it's a relationship based, and our goal is to become more like our. Well, I guess our our master, our discipler, however you want to say it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what that is. Like a really big helicopter or a fleet of them? We are experiencing turbulence. Be right back after this break. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um. Usually we don't have. I think it's just a bunch of fighter jets. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so as has kind of been put forth by, um, kind of several of the sermons here actually in this church, um, kind of our goal is, is growth is to progress, to be making progress toward becoming like Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of how, to some extent, that's how God measures us and judges us is have you made progress? It's not necessarily about where you started or where you ended. It's about are you further than when you you began, you know, reasonably further. Yeah. So I think of, like, the parable of the talents, you know. Mm -hmm. One guy was given one, one guy was given two, and one guy was given five. Um, And the guy with five doubled his. The guy with two doubled – actually, he he got all the way up to five, didn't he? I think some stories are different, but – well, there's like, yeah, there are a couple of versions in different Gospels, but he, we'll say he doubled them. And then the guy with one, he was kind of scared and he just kept his and didn't do anything with it. Yeah. And he was the one who who got thrown into the place with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, 
something to notice about that is I think if we let's let's kind of uh, paint a mental picture here. What if the guy who was given five was afraid and had kept all five of his? And then the guy with one had doubled and then he had two. He still doesn't have that many. But what if? Mm-hmm. Look. Because he would have had less than the guy with five, but but he wouldn't. Have, the guy with five would have been plateauing. Yeah, the the guy, the guy with five would have been not using what he was given, um, mm-hmm. and so and and I think if the story had played out that way, then then the way Jesus would have said it was the the guy who with five, even though he had the most, he didn't do anything with him, and so. He was the one who's, you know, in hot water. <laughs> um, it's an interesting thing to think about because, so in the story, the talents are technically money, but I like to think of them as talents, literally, like abilities. Yeah. We all have abilities, right? Um, some of us more than others. Some of us more than others, but we all have our unique ways of, uh, our unique gifts, our unique ways that we can um, serve God, essentially. And mm-hmm. we can all grow those abilities by using them and then acquiring new abilities or we can do nothing with them and that's essentially how we can apply the parable of the talents to today the person who's maturing should be progressing he should be using what he's been given right um Mm -hmm. and it's interesting because we have a lot of churches kind of conf- or might kind of conflate um, skills or abilities and character. Mm. And I think it's a good thing to remember is that there's two types of like growing as far in a Christian context. You're growing your character and you're growing in your skills. Because, mm-hmm. um, and I think both of, both are uh, equally, you you. Well, you can't successfully serve God if you don't do both. Um, some people, some people might be, have a really good character, but if they don't use it, then it doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. And some people have a lot of skills, but if they have bad character, then that's really dangerous because yeah, they can be leading large crowds, but then then they can lead them all astray. Right. And so, so it's like yeah, it's um, with any. With any talents or abilities comes the responsibility of having a good character. Mm-hmm. And with a good character comes the responsibility of using that for good. Well, if we have a good character, we naturally should. Yeah, but if you don't have talents or, til- or talents or skills, that's very difficult. It is difficult. I, I think you would probably find a way. Um, you'd have to grow talents and skills. You would have to grow talents and skills or just be bad at doing something good, but still be doing it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's an option. Um you know, like people who are not very good or who hate public speaking, you know, sometimes they can still do it well enough because they have the the character and the passion to do it, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's like we were talking about before the podcast. We have this desire to teach and to help people to mature in Christ, but we feel like we struggle with um, developing connections. Mm-hmm. And so... So one, so like the desire to help people and to teach and to um, help people is is our is our character, and the struggle to build connections is our lack of skills. Mm-hmm. Um, so but, yeah, it, it, that's two it's two different parts of maturing in Christ, I guess. I think, I think the main one though, probably for maturing spiritually, when we're talking about that, is is. Uh, character essentially i think that's the main one i think skills are kind of um the lens through which character is used almost it's like the tool that character uses yeah but i I think developing skills is kind of a separate thing than maturing spiritually that's kind of just learning growing other ways um Mm -hmm. i would say um because most of the verses I think that talk about you know what Christians should be like or how they should mature, it's talking about their character, about who they are. Um, it's not talking about 
you know, whether or not they're <laughs> good public speakers or good people, they're people persons, you know, it's talking about, it talks about things like, you know, love, faith, hope, things mm. like this. Um, so um, I have a verse here, or a few verses for, um, along the lines of, we should all be maturing spiritually. This comes from uh, Philippians three thirteen through 16. Um, and this is Paul speaking, and these are just really great verses. Because here is Paul, who's, you know, one of the apostles. He's done a ton of really great work. He's started a lot of churches. He's traveled all over several times. And here is how he views things. Uh, so Philippians 3.13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many of us as are perfect, have this attitude, and if anyone, and if anything, and if anything, if, and if anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So, I think essentially this is the, well, this is the attitude we should all have, is that no matter what we have already done, no matter how far we've already come, we can never regard ourselves as having laid hold of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the reasons why people uh, plateau spiritually or why they're not growing is because they think they're pretty good already. They don't see sins in themselves, or they don't see the need to keep growing, right? I think that's probably one of the number one reasons why people plateau. They don't see the need. Um, or they think they've already gotten there. But we cannot do that. Like, I, we've, we've talked about this before. You can't believe yourself to have gotten there, you know? Yeah. You can't think of yourself as a good Christian. <laughs> um, Paul didn't. Even Paul. Um, mm. Yeah. And then Paul's the person I looked up to. But. And so Paul's whole attitude was, yeah, I'm just going to forget what I've already done. I'm going to be focusing on what I'm still yet to do, right? I'm still, I'm focused on the next thing that I need to grow in, the next way I need to mature. Um, that was his attitude. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, it's interesting because, like, Christianity is a, it's it's a lifestyle of 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 growing hmm. um because it's it's like we're giving a a goal and that goal is to become more like Christ and that is a goal that we never surpass mm -hmm. um and so like like with school like for if you go to college you have a goal to learn enough to earn a degree and eventually reach that goal. But it's like the Christianity is the same way, except for we never reach the goal. Mm -hmm. the, it's like those people who never stop going to college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just another degree and another degree. There's always more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so, or, or we have a goal. We just don't have, we just don't have the ability to reach it, but that's where grace comes in. I guess so. Mm. And I think we're going to talk about that later with like, with talking about how we can grow is that part of it is, well, we can't fully do it on our own, but we can ask, mm. you know? Um, and so we'll get to that later. So kind of wrapping up this first section, we've talked about um, the fact that we should all be growing spiritually. And so since, we should be growing, you know, spiritually. Ever, everyone should be able to kind of look back and see some ways that they have grown. And so something I wanted us to talk about for just a little while is, is what are some ways that you can see that you have matured in recent years or that you've grown um, spiritually? Mm. Um. you on the spot <laughs> so you did have the opportunity to read the question ahead of time just gonna point that out <laughs> uh, yeah so I, I guess one of the ways is I 
that I've matured and that I've put more focus onto um, God and His Word in my life, my daily routine or whatever. Um, and then one of the ways that I'm st still in the beginning stages of learning is to try to make a better effort to think or connect with, or to think about other people more, I guess. Mm. And that's something I'm just beginning to work on, but yeah. Um, I think a lot of times it's a, it's a, it's a graining. You never fully learn something. You're just always working on things and you have various stages of, of learning in each of them. So, um, if I were to answer this question, um, I'd probably have, I could probably answer a lot of things. Um, one would be developing a renewed sense of, um, I guess, empathy or compassion for other people, <laughs> for, especially for people that I've in the past kind of been cold hearted and closed towards like the, the, uh, people who are in need and the poor, I largely have just kind of, you know, overlooked them and thought that they didn't, they didn't really, you know, they weren't really that poor. They could get out of it if they wanted, all this kind of thinking. And also towards non-Christians, um, that's another way that I've just kind of, my view has been shifting and I've just been realizing like, hey, you know, I can't just ignore these people. Mm -hmm. um, I think another way that I've been uh, changing is, is in the past few months especially is um, I spend a lot more time thinking about spiritual things and about God and about um, about different things. I, I'd say if I were to compare myself now to like you know half a year ago or a year ago, I would say I I, I hunger and thirst a lot more to become mature and to grow. You know, I'm not necessarily there yet on a lot of issues, but I want it a lot more. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a good thing to think about, um, you know, and something I think everyone watching this should also probably think about is what, you know, can you, can you point to things that you've grown in um, or that you are currently growing in? I know when I think of it for myself, it always feels like, you know, every few months there's like a moment when I look back and I think like, man, I used to be so stupid <laughs> or like, man, like, oh, I was so like naive back then or something like that. And I, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> you should better to look back and be like, man, I was so stupid than to look back and say, I used to be so much better than I am. Uh, anyway, um, so just a thought. Um, so now I want to move on to have us talking about, um, I guess, some of the attributes of mature Christians. Or in other words, uh, what makes us mature? Like there are certain things that mature Christians should be able to do and should um, be more like. And you could just give the blanket answer, they're more like Christ. But what are some of the specifics that we can talk about? Um what marks a mature Christian? Do you have any ideas? Um, and we can read some verses if you want. Well, I mean, if you interact with a mature Christian, you can... Or if you know a mature Christian, it's easy to tell by, like, their um, demeanor that they are a Christian or something. Uh, if, like, a person is, I guess, full of, has peace and hope, those are some things that are fairly easy to spot. Or if you know somebody. Um, and doesn't get angry easily. Mm -hmm. um, slow to anger slow to anger um, probably someone that doesn't uh, complain a lot or talk about themselves all the time 
Mm. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like, because you can definitely like spot things like that. So you're kind of saying that mature Christians in some ways, they kind of stand out. Like, yeah, there's things about them that is like, that's different. You know, they're, they're different than other people around them. Yeah. Um, which goes hand in hand with the idea of being salty, right? <laughs> our our entire um, <laughs> the thing we're supposed to our, our core theme is supposed to be our core theme. We don't always uh, remember that very often. Being salty Christians, what does that mean? It means having taste, being you know noticeably different than mm-hmm. than everything else that's flavorless, and. So you, you know, that's what I kind of hear when you're pointing out some of these various things, you know, they don't get phone call. They don't get angry very easily. They don't, several other things. Um, it, the thing that's, that sticks out to me as is they're different. Mm-hmm. They are not, um, if they were like everyone else, you wouldn't notice anything different about them, right? Um, yeah. And, and I guess that's kind of like, one way you can kind of check yourself in like in different environments is thing yeah things like n- not given to complaining or anger or or swearing or mm-hmm. different things like that and is kind of a way you can measure yourself a little bit to some degree mm-hmm. and i think um there are a lot of really great passages that describe here's what a christian should be Mm. and we're not going to read through all of them but i have some of them written down so i would say the sermon on the mount you could start with the beatitudes but really just almost the entire thing is Mm. like if you could embody that sermon you'd be doing pretty good um so that's matthew 5 through 7 um in second peter 1 verses 5 through 11 he talked he lists a bunch of traits that that christians should be and that so like um Faith, you know, knowledge, moral excellence, um, brotherly kind. I'm going to get them all wrong. but, <laughs> um, And he actually specifically states in that passage that if these traits are yours and and they are increasing, then you are neither useless nor unfruitful. Mm. And then I think later on he even states, um, you know, if you have these, then your entrance into the kingdom of heaven will be supplied. Um, so that's a pretty strong promise. Um uh, Colossians chapter three kind of contrasts what the old self, the, the non-Christian self, was like to the what the the new self is like. The new Christian um, lists a lot of really good things there. I also think First Corinthians chapter eleven or not eleven thirteen, where it talks about love, and it describes the attributes of love. I think that kind of goes in the same bucket with um, things we can emulate our lives off of, right? Um, if God is love and we're trying to be like him, then we should try to <laughs> try to be loving. Yeah. <laughs> um, other things like the armor of God and the spirit of truth. Those are ways we can measure ourselves, you know, just list through those things and ask, okay, am I, am I all these attributes, you know? Um, well, um, Yeah, the armor of God has a lot of. It's not really. I'm not sure if I describe them as attributes, but more of uh, gifts, or. Well, so so there are some things like the, the I guess there there it's more of maybe tools you could say, um, the belt of truth, um, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, but it, a lot of them are things that you can be as well. Um, well, a lot of those things are something that you should. You would kind of uh, inherit upon becoming a Christian. Or rely on. Or rely on. So like salvation, that's not something that you are. It's something that you receive and it's... Yeah. And it, you know, it's, it, you know, it, 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 in that case, it's, the, it's a helmet because it's, you know, it's prominent. But at the same time, you need other things like truth and a love for truth. That's kind of like the thing that is at your core almost, you know, it, mm. I don't know. Maybe that maybe the armor of God is not as totally falls into this bucket as some of the other things, but um, 
And there are other ones that I probably didn't think about, but there there are a lot of times in the New Testament where it it lists um, trait the traits of a Christian, and mm. I even point to like when it this is it's describing um, the traits for elders or deacons. You may not think that's uh, applicable to most people, but if you think about it, if elders are supposed to be like the um, like the the best examples, like the ideal among Christians, then we should all kind of want to have the traits of elders, right? Yeah. We should all want to be, um, with, you know, blameless, um, loving, all those, all the traits of elders kind of also should be things that a Christian should want to be. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So we have, Here, why don't you go ahead and read it? This is Hebrews five twelve through six two. So, yeah. For by this time you ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the more elementary principles principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only a milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, because who practice it, because who because of practice have made their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching of Christ, let us press on to our maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of insurrection about washing the laying of on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So. The one thing that stands out for me is verse 14 is like one of the things that as we mature in Christ, we should probably become better at is discerning good from evil. Mm-hmm. So so if we're talking about mature Christians should be able to do certain things, according to this passage, one of the things it says is um, someone who has, you know, a strong knowledge of of the Bible and, you know, has been around the block, I guess you could say, they should be able to discern what is good and evil. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm not sure if it's necessarily, it doesn't just come from the knowledge of the Bible. It comes from probably spending time with God in prayer and oh, yes. other things like that. Um, um, yeah, is because yeah, discerning good from evil is one of, does make, it does make sense as one of the key attributes or key like things about a mature Christian mm-hmm. because like you know, a mature Christian doesn't need, shouldn't need to have somebody tell them if something is good or bad. They should be able. Yeah. To, they or, should maybe they maybe talk with people about it, but they don't need to yeah. like. Oh, like I, you know, I just don't know. Like, yeah, they, they shouldn't. They should shouldn't end on. Oh well, it's just a gray area. They should be able to say for sure. Um, yeah, and to some degree. Because like a newer Christian, you might, you could they could be like. Or it's easy. They might let smaller sins slip by because they feel like they're not that bad or something. And I think for newer Christians, it's also really easy to get caught up in thinking, you know, certain things that are said in the New Testament are like super important and, um, you know, like if, if you if you didn't fully understand a passage, you might interpret it one way and think like, oh, you know, the you know t- things like talking like talking about uh like meat sacrificed idols or like hair length or head covering kind of issues kind of like that um i think p- new christians might misunderstand them and they don't fully um they don't know the heart of god enough to really have be able to discern it very well mm. if that makes sense um, yeah yeah that's kind of what is part about being discerning good from evil is to is to sp- Spend time in prayer and God's word to learn the heart of God. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so you're good to point out that it wasn't. It's not just knowledge of the Bible. It's really um, it's using it's, the using the Bible to try to know God. Well, you use the Bible because that's how we. That's the you yeah. know that's how we know um, what God is like. Yeah, um, and, and, and there's other ways too. Like and, He reveals Himself in you know a lot of different ways. Right, and so and 
uh, spending time in prayer with him. And I, I really like the, the words that it uses here, at least in the, the New American Standard, is they have their senses trained. So you think, like, mm-hmm. you might have your nose, like, you you know, you can discern a specific smell or something, um, or a sound. You can hear a sound and you can know what it is because you you've experienced it enough times to be able to say for certain. So mm-hmm. a mature Christian, because of their knowledge of of the Bible and of who God is and what he's like, they can can pretty well discern an issue even if maybe the Bible doesn't say that much on it. And I, I think yeah. this I think this is really where, you know, some people say the Bible has a lot of like gray areas or um, maybe even contradictions or something. Um, there are a lot of issues that the Bible doesn't talk about very much. Yeah. I think what this is saying is that the mature Christian should be able to, in those cases where the Bible does not specifically say this is wrong or this is right, they can know kind of in a broader context what is good to do in that scenario. Yeah. Because, yeah, like every single issue that comes that comes up in like the cultural or political sphere in the U.S., it's not all addressed by the Bible. Like, you, it doesn't say, like, for example, the Bible doesn't say, like, transgenderism is wrong. That's a big one because um, it hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> but, or, or, or it doesn't mention drugs at all. Yeah, it doesn't say don't do drugs. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different things. And, and so part of being a mature Christian is, using, is being able to use common sense uh, or using a common sense application of the Bible to, well, I guess, no, let's rephrase this. Part of being a mature Christian is is to, is knowing the heart of God, mm-hmm. is, is to learn the heart of God through many different ways. Um, and so, because you don't need a yes or no answer to everything. You know God's heart mm-hmm. and you, and you seek to try to do its best based off well, I think like to um, some of Paul's words, you know, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Mm. So that kind of shows he's kind of on a very mature level and that he sees, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that the that God doesn't care that much about. Like they're not really wrong, but they're not useful to me. They're not, they don't, they don't strengthen me as a Christian. They don't, you know, bring me forward. And so... There are some things that even though they aren't wrong, I'm not going to do them, essentially. Mm. Um, well, like for him, it was marriage. but <laughs> Well, for, yeah, for him, it was marriage. Marriage isn't wrong at all. But he decided, I can be so much more effective for God if I'm single. And I think, and then he even encouraged other people, like, hey, if you can stay single, do it. It's going to be so much better. Yeah. And not because it's a law at all, but because it was beneficial. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I think one more thing we should mention on the idea of discerning good and evil is that it's always something you have to be careful on, but the mature Christian knows they have to be careful on it, you know. The mature Christian is constantly examining their themselves and their own motives and, and also talking with other people to make sure that they got it right. <laughs> yeah. It, it's very dangerous to just, to just say, like, oh, I know the heart of God so well that this is wrong or this is right, and then tell a bunch of other people. <laughs> you know, you have to... It it is a careful issue, but the mature Christian knows that you have to be careful on it. Yeah, um, and it kind of like uh, in, in the opposite of like a mature Christian, and that would be like a if there's an immature Christian that recently became a Christian, or maybe became a Christian a long time ago and hasn't grown. Yeah, but anyway, part of like if they don't have a good, they don't know the heart of God well enough to just have a good discernment of good and evil. They, sins might slip into their life they don't even recognize, mm-hmm. and so that's part of that's part of the advantage of knowing good from evil is that you can see uh, uh, you start to see sins better in your own life mm-hmm. because because of your maturity you can recognize them that you may not even realized you had before you gained that maturity. Mm-hmm. Definitely, um, like yeah. So you ha- you have to. A good enough person to see the bad things in your life. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And the mature person will examine themselves. Um, I think another thing in this passage that is notable is um, just in the beginning of verse 12, um, by this time you ought to be teachers, 
but you instead have again need for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. So he said, um, so the writer is saying to, he's saying, if you're mature, you should be able to teach people what you know. You should be able to share what you know, but instead you are, you know, you're so dull of hearing that you need someone to continue reminding you of the basics, you know? Mm. Um, and I think, we and I think it should be mentioned here. It's not talking about like teachers, as in like everyone's got to become a preacher or lead a class or something. It's saying you should be able to teach and explain what you believe to other people. I mean, it only makes sense, right? Yeah. Um. You ought to be able to to explain why you believe what you believe. That that's just, and you should be able to um. Definitely at least explain the basics, the elementary principles, as the writer puts it. Mm -hmm. um, and this passage very, very specifically relates to maturing because the, the writer even uses the imagery of like of infants and the ones who are not um, accustomed to the word of righteousness as being spiritual infants and they require milk. <laughs> they can't take the solid food yet. And it's really great imagery. Um, think about um so okay to close out this section of um we kind of talked a little bit about um how mature christians should be able to do certain things and there's a lot more that we could go into on this for sure um but as a kind of a general question as a whole when you read the biblical standards for maturity do you feel like you measure up <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, simple answer for me. It's no, too. Um, and, and part of it is because, like, the starting good from evil. Cause, um, well, that's hard. <laughs> well, it's hard because but I'm starting into, I'm, I feel like I'm just starting to, like, notice some things I haven't, that have kind of slipped by for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then that made me think, like, if there's this thing that's been slipping by for a while, then there's probably a lot more. <laughs> kind of an eye opening moment, yeah. Yeah. I, oh, I've heard of people doing that before, too, where they'll, like, really read and study a passage and maybe even look at the Greek, and then they'll realize there's something different about the wording, and the passage totally, like, changes to them, and like, oh, if I miss this, like, what else could I be missing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and and so, I th and obviously, so I have a lot more to go in discerning good from evil, mm -hmm. and that's just one thing. Yeah, definitely... Well, I guess it should be said, mature, maturity is not like a black and white. It's not like you're either immature or you're mature. It is a spectrum. And I can, you know, I look at some of these passages we've talked about, and on some things I can be like, okay, you know, I, I am usually pretty good at that. And then other things, it's like, no, I have so much more to go. Like, um, uh, I know in... In his book, Crazy Love, Francis Chan recommended this. He's specifically talking about 1 Corinthians 13, where it's talking about love. But he said, so substitute your name for love and then read through that list. <laughs> so like, okay, love is gentle, love is kind. Um, oh, yeah. Is, or no, it's not gentle, it's patient. And so instead you say, so Thomas is patient, Thomas is kind, Thomas... Um, <laughs> bears up under all things. Thomas endures all. So it's yeah. kind of like a, a morning, like prep to our self pep talk. Kind of a little bit, um, but it's also an exercise in that it says, okay, if you can get through the whole thing, and if you feel like a liar, something needs to change. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, I tried. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> like because there are, there are a couple issues where I'm like, yeah, you know, most of the time I'm I'm reasonably good at being patient or or this other thing, but then there's other things where it's like. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's a good exercise. You can, and, you know, that's specifically for uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I think any time it lists the, the attributes of a Christian, you could do a similar thing. And and in most cases, probably there'll be somewhere to say, you know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm decent at that, and some that you're terrible at. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the bottom line is none of us really measure up. <laughs> <laughs> But as long as we're getting there, that's important. Okay, um, last last section I guess we want to talk about is 
how we grow matured, um, how we can um, become more like Christ. I think a lot of times we say that we're growing or acknowledge that we need to grow and then we don't like commit and like focus on how we're going to do it right mm. uh so we've already mentioned a couple ways though um spending a lot of time in the word <laughs> for one uh praying with god you know really trying to you know be soul to soul you know and and um just talking with him those are really good ways um First Peter 2, 1 through 3 mentions uh, spending time in the Word. So, therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So here we have another uh, babies and milk metaphor. In this case, it's saying he, he's actually encouraging us to be like babies who... Um, they long for the milk, you know. They need it. <laughs> um, so in this case, though, the milk is it's the word. It's the Bible. We should long to learn from it so that we can grow. And I think that's really one of the main ways that we do grow is is because the Bible is one of the main ways that we can know what God is like and what he wants for our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't spend time in the Bible we are going to probably get a different picture of what we should be like. You know, if we're just paying attention to culture, we're going to get a totally different idea of what is right. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, part of uh, the first step towards a, Becoming more mature is wanting to become more mature, and that's kind of synonymous with wanting to spend time more time in God's Word, I guess, mm. because that's one of the best ways, or one of the ways. Yeah, and going right along with that prayer. Um, and speaking of prayer, I think we, okay, so we mentioned a little earlier that when it comes right down to it, you know, in our sinful nature, there are a lot of things that we're just not going to do on our own because, you know, if we're looking out for our own wants and interests, we're just not going to do them. So we have to ask. Um, so in Revelation chapter 3, it's it's in the letter to all the, the, the seven churches, specifically the church of Laodicea, something that um, Jesus speaking there mentions. Um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will grant him to sit down with me on the throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So what is was what was one of the things he was telling the the Odysseans there? Just open the door. Mm -hmm. And I think earlier he also mentioned, you know, buy for me white garments and, and gold and salve for your eyes so that you can see. But when it comes down to it, you know, he's knocking. He just wanted them to open the door to let him in, essentially. And I think this really relates to us um, seeking God and to us wanting him to change us and asking for him to change us, right? I know personally it really works a lot of... It, it really works wonders when you actually ask God to change something about you, you know? And I hadn't done this until maybe um, maybe a month or two ago. I had never done it. But actually getting to the point is like, you know, like confessing, like, you know, God, you know, I'm really bad in this, this area of my life. Please change me. And it was fairly, you know, it was revolutionary because when you're actually praying for God to change you, change does come in your life. And it's, kind of weird how that works out <laughs> um yeah and i guess it comes down to god's not going to help us we're not gonna, if we're not if we think we're we're made it right yeah and so i, I guess <laughs> it goes back to discerning good from evil is we should 
spend more time recognizing the sins we have so we can we can ask God to help us. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Yeah. It, and then, yeah, going beyond just recognizing them then asking to be changed. Um, yeah. I think there are a lot of verses about... Um, this idea of like opening the door seeking, I think in, in John chapter 10, he uses the, Jesus uses the metaphor of um, like the sheepfold and uh, people standing at the door and knocking, uh, something like that. Um, and he wanted them to go through the door. Um, also, Jesus said things like, you know, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you or seek and you will find, Right. Um, or in the Beatitudes, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, so I kind of think these are things that really we need. They're kind of prerequisites if we're going to change. We need to want to change. Mm-hmm. We need to... Um, we need to want it before we're actually going to try to get it, I guess. Um we're in, in Romans chapter 12, you know, um, do not make conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this idea of asking God to do that transforming, to renew your mind, to make it something new. Um, I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on how we can grow uh, spiritually? Um, yeah, pretty much wraps it up. Yeah, it's 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 wanting to, and then it's asking God to help you. Um, yeah, and I think sometimes also the person who's really intent on changing will also ask other people maybe to pray for them or to for advice or things like that which i'm not very good at but (laughs) um god please make me better at that (laughs) um so to close out i wanted to ask do you have any ways that you i don't know focus or track your growth or i guess set goals or something spiritually uh, not just talking about you know physical learning or growth do you have any ways that you focus and track that Mm, no i don't Okay. I I would say the probably the only way that I really have, which is not really that that it's not really tracking, but um I gave up New Year's resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Because they're all stupid and no one ever does them. So instead what I resolved to do in this Was oh, it on New Year's? Well it's it's kind of it's kinda of like a whole year long thing. Or did you resolve to do it on New Year's? I suppose. So I guess it is kind of a resolution, but it's not like your typical resolution, like I'm going to lose X number of pounds and or something dumb like that. It so, and this started a couple of years ago. Is I had my my idea was to, okay, I'm going to commit to trying to grow in a specific area of my life for the entire year, mm. basically. So, um, and then. And then I'm just going to think about it throughout the year and I'm going to be pushing for it throughout the year. Um, and that actually worked out really well. Um, right. This, th- this year, um, the thing that I was really wanting to focus on was um, more constantly um, spending time thinking about, talking about, um, about God, essentially. Wanting to make him like a, essentially a constant part of my life because I realized there was a problem that I didn't, you know, a lot of the time I wasn't actually thinking about spiritual matters or anything like that. So I wanted to make him part of like all my conversations, all my thoughts and years only halfway through, but there's been some progress in that at least. Mm. I, I think I am at least definitely thinking about spiritual things more often. Um, but anyway, I guess that's my, that's really my one trick of like tracking growth or whatnot it's it's just setting a goal for a year and then sometimes i would also set like mini goals for a month or something but 
and it's really like it's 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 not really tracking because it's totally hands off. I'm not forcing myself. I'm just kind of committing to growing somehow. Mm. Anyway, um, so that pretty much wraps up our thoughts. Um, a lot can be said on this issue, I think, but we're running out of time. So um, it's important to be maturing all the time. Yeah, all the time. Um, the mature Christian should be should be different. We should we should stand out from people in everyday life, um, because if we don't, if if most of our life is just like everybody else lives, then something is wrong. We should be different. We should be salty, shouldn't we? No. Yeah. We should be the salt of the earth. That's what. We gotta be, gotta be tasty. So, uh, yeah, basically that's the point. Keep, keep growing saltier. Um, go and be salty. Go and go and be salty. This is episode seven, not sixteen. <laughs> Seventeen, not sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna stop there.